Let's talk about this amazing album, Resistance is Futile. Is it? I got the tongue in cheek, obviously, but but why? Where, where did the idea to that come from? Um, I think, well, obviously, we're on our 13th album. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we're 48 and 49 this year. Um, uh, young chickens. Oh, yes, we're young chickens. Um, and obviously, we've, you know, we've seen everything change in our industry alone, let alone society or culture or politics or whatever. Um, and... It feels like the mar- the relentless march of progress is sometimes at the cost of many many things, and you're just left with memory. So it's not a sen- it's not being sentimental. Uh, it's just sometimes you're all, all you're left with is memory, and also the relentless march of how opinions are formed so fast now, and how it affects politics now, and makes politics more uh, polarized now. We live in an age of antipathy. It just feels as if <clears throat> the old assurances are not there to fall back on anymore. So you can't write those songs anymore because they would just be folly to write those songs. But, you know, the pockets of resistance are our relentless march towards an obsession with mel- melody, our relentless questioning, you know, our relentless like, search for some kind of answer to our own questions. So it is double. it is a double-sided coin, definitely. But, you know, there's no doubt that we realise that our place in things is very different now. Um, you know, we're blues men now. You know, yeah, we're real, we're authentic. We're, we're from a different age, so to speak. Um, so I think all that is mixed in there, definitely. It's it's basically, it's just living up to, you know, the facts that are in front of you, basically. So I think it's crazy. I mean, these days, someone can, can spread their opinion out on YouTube or on, on Facebook or Twitter while back in the day, you know. Yeah, I mean, can I, I don't think you're allowed, I don't think you're afforded that grey area anymore where you you kind of make a decision in your head and you form an opinion about something or somebody and then you're allowed to have your mind changed by meeting that person or learning new facts now your opinion needs to be you know forced through and you need to form an opinion within a minute and then you've got to post it up and then you must stick to that self-made party line Uh, whereas you know i think you know we'd been taught many lessons down the years where we had a quite militant opinion about something or somebody and then you were forced to change your mind or you were forced to change tactics you know we came from the holy bible you know obviously self-willingly nihilistic uh, self-willingly destructive to try and start again and then we realized that that road had ended and we had to go to everything must go we had to be a bit more hopeful and a bit more um, escapist so I, I just think that the way that opinions are formed now just leaves you on, on, on down a, on, to a one track answer really I mean it's quite good that you're mentioning that yourself but like after 13 albums because like I, I know a lot of, of musicians who after their fifth album even or even their second they don't have anything to say or they don't feel it's worth saying and that you, you are still at it and still doing a good job at it. What keeps you ticking? Well, there's nothing self-righteous for me to say. I'm not going to say, well, you know, you must try harder or something, <laughs> you know, but it's just, I think we're just very good at being with each other. We're very good at enjoying each other's company. We're very good also at staying out of each other's way where we, when we know we're going to piss each other off. <laughs> You know, um, and, you know, for a band to get to its 13 album is, is very, very rare. You know, we know that. Um, our shared history, you know, the fact that we we're all friends before we were in a band, all that helps. But the bottom line is that we actually enjoy it. We actually enjoy being in a band. We enjoy going to the studio. We enjoy all watching the TV together and having a moan about something, whether it be watching Andrew Neil on this week, uh, you know, whether it be about sports, whether it be about music, anything. We enjoy being with each other and then we enjoy going downstairs and just having a bash and mm. just and just doing something and creating a song which sometimes is just rubbish and sometimes is great. Uh, and just to have the will to go into the studio is important because I don't have to force myself to go there. I never, I ever, I never think I'd rather not go there today. I always think, right, I'm off to see Nick and Sean at the studio. <laughs> You know, and it's going to be good. Something good might happen today. Um, as long as you've got that urge, then it's quite easy, I think. Let's talk about some of the song of, uh, songs of the album. My favourite song is um, Sequels of Forgotten Wars. I mean, the title itself, before I even listened to it, I kind of felt it's like as if something, history is repeating itself. Yeah, there's an element of that. There's an element of kind of not learning any lessons that we might have been taught. Um, and also it's it's about 
I suppose how the the kind of 24-hour news cycle dra- dramatizes news itself, that as if news, you know, the events that go on around us are not enough. They're dramatized. They're endlessly uh, kind of like um, polarized by different opinions. Whereas sometimes I just feel as if I want just a cold harsh gaze of reporting rather than the deep investigation and the talking shop and the and the inevitable echo chamber that goes along with it um it's kind of you know so the dra- the dramatization of news itself i think is quite damaging even though i'm an inveterate news watcher so i'm kind of a guilty of just taking it all in myself um but also i think how it's the age of schism you know it's the age of where even labor supporters can't agree on anything with each other <laughs> yeah. um and kind of the, the way we're kind of you know i, I i'll freely admit i'm a, you know i buy the guardian every day but sometimes i read the guardian and i think it's just an echo chamber for one you know it's just an echo chamber for kind of metropolitan kind of like worthiness and it doesn't connect with the rest of the country and i buy the guardian every day <laughs> so kind of like sometimes i look at you know the I look at the terrain and i think it's just an echo chamber you know we we don't learn anything whatsoever everything is a sequel to a mistake we've made in the past I think right about five years ago, I think myself and Nick probably said something like, there's enough to be going on. We've had two absolute boom and bust recessions and countless conflicts. You know, there's enough for young artists to be writing about and putting, put, putting it in their songs. I think I said that about five years ago. Yeah. But now, I don't know if I actually feel that because... How do you write these lyrics now? It would be so intractable. <laughs> it would be, it would, it's, it's so much more complicated to actually write that lyric now. You know, I come from an age where you know you define yourself by your enemy. You just you define yourself by what you are against. Exactly. It's harder to do that now. It's really much harder to do that now because you know the same side can't even agree, can't even agree on what the solution is to public spending, the NHS, Brexit, whatever. You know, the same side can't even agree on it. Whether it be Labour front benches or the Tory, you know, back benches. It's harder to write that lyric now. I wouldn't want to try and write that lyric now if I was young, and I didn't have the experience of of knowing that kind of like you, that you've got to have some kind of levity when you're doing it. You know, well, who's Vivian? She was a woman that was a nanny to kind of uh, middle class families in Boston, New York area uh, in the 50s and 60s. Um, she didn't really have a, a an interior. She didn't really have a sorry a family life. Um, and she was just a nanny to middle class and upper middle classes families, their children. Um, and when she passed away, you know, there was no, there was no real uh, indelible mark that she left um, for people to remember her mm. until um, uh, a guy that was obsessed with old uh, photography, uh, f- photographic slides and, and just old photographs from like, you know, post-war photographs. He went to a public like auction where people's effects after they died you know, were being sold. And he was always on the lookout for old, uh, old, like, um, negatives from post-war photographers. Oh, and he found this job lot of just th- hundreds of thousands of just like, uh, negatives from this one lady, which was Vivian Mayer. So he bought them up thinking, oh, he looked at a couple of them there at the sale and he thought, oh, oh I can pick this up for cheap. The ph- photographs look really good. Oh. So he bought these hundreds of thousands of like old, 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 ne- old negatives, took them home. And then when he started looking at them all, he quickly realized that they were amazing. They're absolutely amazing photographs. Um, and he took them to a lot of galleries and people would say, oh my God, this, this must be the work of Frank Capper or something like that. <laughs> and he was like, no, it's a lady called Vivian Mayer. And um, everybody was like, no, it can't be. I've never heard of her. So he started digging into her life and realized that she was just this woman that had this life. It was She was just, you know, she was a nanny, uh, but she had no family life. She didn't really have that many friends. And then all her life, she had taken these photographs. She had documented, you know, Boston and New York in in those incredible boom years of the 60s and late 50s etc and she had been this photographic journalist without um, you know you know without any kind of mission except for to she loved the aesthetic of recording things and she'd become amazing at it and she had no ambition to show she had no ambition she had no brief from any editor it was just her interior life and she loved doing it wow and um i know obviously you know in photographs uh, yeah, or the actual the actual uh, her actual prints just go for a lot of money and and people realized that you know she was self-taught and she, you know she was completely independent and it was just for her it was for nobody else and i just love the story of this person that just had no ambition except for 
the only ambition she had was to quench her personal aesthetic. It's just her passion. And to get better at it. Mm. And and she became better at, it, better at it than most people out there. And um, without anybody ever knowing it, and without anybody teaching her, and without any kind of end result except for her personal satisfaction. And I love the idea of, a, of that life, of just mm. being a question mark, mm. rather than there being a definable ending or, or there being some resolution. It was just her life and that's what she did. And she was happy with it. What, Caitlin and Dylan, uh, I just thought, first of all, I thought, is it just about two alcoholics? <laughs> uh, Dylan and Caitlin, obviously, is about Dylan Thomas and Caitlin, um, his partner. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's basically, it's about a mutually abusive relationship. You know, um, it's about two people that kind of deserved each other, but they needed that high octane life of... And cheating on each other all the time. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. Uh, of just, you know, of explosion and reconciliation. They were the, those kind of people that, were, that live in that kind of like a drama filled life. And some people actively seek out healthy relationships. Most people do. And sometimes they find, you know, the kind of, you know, that's enough for them. But for people like that, sometimes they need something else. Um, yeah, a lot of their families would disagree now, their descendants, but they actively sought each other out and stayed in that relationship for a long time. And they fueled each other. Um, it was to their detriment in the end, but it's kind of, I don't know, it's just kind of healthy to look at relationships that are formed in a way that we wouldn't necessarily think was right sometimes. Who's collaborating with you on that? It's somebody called Catherine. She's from a group, group called The Anchoress, mm -hmm. which is kind of her project. Um, she's sung with us on stage many a time. Uh, she's a great singer. She's got such a strong voice. And uh, we just wanted somebody that could really personalise the lyric because we, obviously the lyric uh, is very much two distinct voices talking to each other. And we just wanted somebody that would be really strong because Caitlin, you know, was a strong character. She was a very, very strong woman um, and she gave as good as she got. Um, um, so we wanted a voice that would rep that would represent that while still having some kind of tenderness when we needed it. And she'd sang with us on stage a couple of times. She'd done Little, little Baby Nothing on stage with us a few times. Wow. And, um, you know, we really like her, her last album. So, um, yeah, it's really cool.